I have been in the photo business for 20 years. Uh, I went to school at RIT in Rochester, 92 to 96. I was still very green. I got here in 96. And uh, I started assisting right away. I interned briefly and then started working for celebrity shooters, for still life, for tabletop. Every single job that I could take because I was learning what I did and did not want to be doing, both subject matter wise and people and how they dealt with people. You know, the, the photographer that threw a bar stool at me didn't well, I didn't want to treat assistants like that. I learned that part. And while I'm assisting for four years, I'm also shooting my own projects. Um, free magazines, tiny hair books, you know, pieces, whatever I can accumulate, you know, to get a tear sheet in a in a magazine here and, you know, just slowly developing my aesthetic. And I started shooting for uh, Getty for about eight years on and off with paid and unpaid uh, projects. So when I say unpaid, what it meant is that I would have to front the money on production, but then I would get paid better in the royalties on the back end. So in the long run, it was much better deal, but I didn't know that at the beginning. So I'm shooting stock in New York. I'm also starting to travel a little bit. I had like the financial flexibility with the agencies where I could go shoot, turn the photographs over, and then get paid in royalties six months later, I was able to just kind of like get this like income stream going to let me keep shooting, keep developing, keep looking for projects. And at the same time, I'm still looking for gallery representation. Like I knew that at some point my goal was to get the photographs big and on the wall. It took, about, it took me about two years to get a big enough list of curators and fine art connected people that would be interested to uh, do a portfolio review and so I set that up as, as an event. And through that, I got my first representation with a gallery in Williamsburg. And this is some of the work that she showed. So while this was going on, I'm starting to make you know, some relationships. And during that, um, I met a book agent. And she was like, I think we should make a book of yours. And I was like, that's great. I've always wanted a book. But I felt that I didn't have a cool enough or a substantial like, body of work to like, make Stephen Mellon's cool coffee table book. So we came up with the idea to focus on the recycling industry. And that was connected back to the industrial landscape work that I was already shooting that I was interested in. And I met an art buyer at McCann who looked at the work and loved the landscape work. And she just said to me, it's like, I can't take this book to Exxon until you have a guy with a wrench. Because they need the picture of the guy with the wrench. They need the human element in the scene as well. But they need. Uh, you know, they need both done by the same photographer for you to land this kind of project. And I was opposed to it for about a year because I was like, I don't want to contaminate the purity of my, you know, the landscape work. And that just wasn't where I was focused. So I was like, all right, so let me, let me, you know, think about merging this. I really still like this picture to this day. But one of the nice things that happened while I was shooting this is that I spotted this. So the MTA had an artificial reef project where they dumped over 2,000 subway cars in the Atlantic over the span of 10 years. And I had read about it right at the beginning of my recycling project, and I thought that the project was done. And so the security guard at the gate of the yard was like, you know, I asked him, like, what's that barge? And I was like, oh, that's the MTA's artificial reef project. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, can I get in to photograph it? And he's like, no. And I was like, well, can, is there someone I can call to get in to photograph it? And so he got me in touch with the general manager for weeks, and then uh, weeks got me to the MTA and they both signed off on it because it's like this is a perfect fit for my recycling project. I've got this book that you know is going to be coming out, and they're like that sounds great. And so I ended up instead of just going into the yard to photograph the barge where it was parked, as I was able to get to the MTA itself where they were loading the trains, and then out onto the chase boat and photograph it when they were throwing the actual subway cars into the Atlantic. So this is happening. All right, now January 15, 2009. Uh, Sully makes an emergency landing in the Hudson River. All right, it's my wife's birthday. We are sitting in a bar watching TV, and uh, somebody at the bar um, was like, I wonder how they're going to get the plane out. And I was like, I know who's going to do this. <laughs> so I call Weeks, and they're like, we don't know if we have it yet, but I'm going to be in a meeting with the Coast Guard and the FBI tomorrow morning, so I'm not going to be able to pick up my phone. So call Tom Weeks. He always answers your, his phone, just remind him you know, who you are, because we'd met on some of these other projects, and I was like, hey, it's Steve Mellon, the photographer, and I'm like, oh, yeah, what's going on? I was like, did you get the job? And I was like, what job? It was like, the, the airplane in the, in the river. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, do you want, do you, do you want to work? <laughs> <laughs> and so I arrived into the crash site 
uh, via the water because I knew that if I tried to tell the NYPD or something that I was a photographer for weeks, they were like, whatever. Um, they weren't going to let me by. So I arrived and just walked into the site with my hard hat on and a life jacket and started photographing at the permission of weeks. And they just saw me as one of the guys. So everyone was, you know, totally fine about it. So uh, fortunately, you know, and the great thing about this uh, emergency ditch in the water is that everybody survived. Um, and that was why I was comfortable photographing it. I don't feel comfortable shooting people's uh, disparity. You know, it's just like don't do war, don't any, generally don't do any kind of uh, work like that. So I brought this to a portfolio review that I had helped organize. Um, one of the dealers. Um, saw it. Actually, two, two different galleries offered me solo shows after they saw this, and they took the larger of the two, which I'm really happy about because I'm still with them to this day. The other gallery closed, so made the right call. But these photographs uh, picked up national press, um, national exhibitions. It's been a traveling show in a number of different places. Um, we've met a number of the passengers. They had a solo show of this work in 2009, and so a number of the passengers came. Um, and at first we were really nervous, but they were really thankful that there's such a like, beautiful documentary of the experience that they had. And so like, we met uh, one of the passengers that was in business class, and she was like, yeah, it was a little bumpy, versus the people that were at, like, in 39C. They were like, it's like hitting a wall of cement. Um, <laughs> interesting thing. Um, <laughs> so getting back. Um, so we take this work down to Miami. Uh, my gallery is at one of the satellite art fairs. The Flight 1549 images do pretty well, uh, along with the solo show. And they're like, you know, if you flush out that subway car project, we might be able to give you another solo show. And so I go back to Weeks, and uh, it's like, you guys still doing this? And they're like, yeah, we're still doing it. We've got a couple more drops. And so we go out with them again and kind of fill out that body of work. Um, this has now been featured in numerous exhibitions and almost every print place and manageable and online. It's had just an amazing, I refer to these photographs as being self-aware because they, they start promoting themselves more than I can imagine. And this is one of the iconic shots. So one of the things that I always love about this image is just like the sense of vertigo because you can see the highlight inside that pole that you've been on. So you start feeling yourself kind of like ah! <laughs> I had started getting a couple of questions like, do you shoot video? And I was just like, no. Um, but then I was like, maybe, but my compromise was to do time lapse. So um, that video was created um, with all still cameras. We set them with intervalometers, shooting a picture about one every five seconds uh, for the most part. There was one shot where you see the bridge kind of sinking, which was a little bit uh, slower because it was going to take so long. And then in post, we would just sometimes speed up uh, the cut. And uh, we dumped like 90% of the footage out of this, like out of the 30,000 frames. Like I said, it's down to a four minute video. So with a lot of that footage either got dumped or sped up. Um, I believe a lot, especially in video, like shoot first, edit later. Um, the video uh, did really well. Um, got picked up by the Wall Street Journal. It got picked up by the Sci-Fi Network. Um, they like they featured it on one of their blogs. It was like you gotta look at this and like Wired and everybody. So um, at one point I get a phone call and it's from the Department of Transportation and they're like, "Hi, um, that's our bridge. And why does your video look better than the one that I paid for?" <laughs> Went in, had a meeting uh, with the director of communications. We bid on the project. I ended up winning the contract. We've been, I've now been shooting stills and video for the Department of Transportation for the past four years as a government contractor, and uh, it's been a great relationship. So after um, the subway cars got uh, picked up by the New York Times, I called uh, my contact at the MTA just letting him know. and. He was like, I don't know if you're interested, but they're sinking a destroyer in a couple of months. <laughs> and so he got me in touch with the people that were doing the salvage operation. And so they put me on a tugboat, and I so went, out, went out with them. So I ended up on a sinking ship um, with them. I wasn't the only person, but um, this is one of the photographs of one of the welders uh, cutting holes in the side of the ship. This picture was a lot of fun, because if you imagine a ship that's doing this, and you've got smoke, and so trying to get the sunbeam lined up with the sparks at the right moment without you know, suffocating in this room. Um, but it did work. Um, that did 
fortunately uh, bring me to Smithsonian. I had gone down to DC about four and a half years ago with my uh, previous agent and presented work uh, both to Nagio and Smithsonian and a couple of other places. And so about a year later, Smithsonian uh, hired me to go photograph the new class of destroyers that was replacing the one that I sank. And so this was inside of a shipyard in Maine where they're building it. One of the other things that I love is being high. And by that, I mean in a lift. So I got them to sign off and get me a 60-foot lift to uh, put me up. This was actually a 100-foot lift, but they would only take me up 60 feet. But it was still high enough for the ship, and I was able to like kind of get them to position exactly my crop and my frame. And it was just a matter of kind of like staying in one spot and just waiting for the right exposure and him and the sparks and everything. But it was, it was worth it. So I did one more video uh, for the New York Times, and uh, there was a couple of hiccups, and at the end, my editor said, we owe you one. And I was like, really? <laughs> because the one thing that I hadn't been able to uh, do yet for the magazine was to actually get into print. Because being based on being a photographer, I still have the you know, obsession about getting into the actual <laughs> magazine that's just onto the site. And we had wanted to do a story on biggest blah, blah, blah. And so I started Googling again for the biggest first whatever, and I, I found the biggest ship. And I found out about the Prelude, which is the largest floating structure ever built by man. It's a liquefied natural gas plant that is actually a giant, giant half ship, half barge um, that is going to be docked off of the coast of Australia for 25 years. Reached out to Shell, who owns it, and spent about six to nine months between conference calls, timing, to get everything signed off between the shipyard, Shell, magazine, um, but we finally got the go-ahead from everything that it, it was about to do this move of these modules, and it was the first module about to be installed, and so they said this will be a good time to come and shoot it. And so uh, the magazine sent me to South Korea in the summer of 2014 for a week to shoot this project. That shot was actually from a remote camera. I had set up a camera because I couldn't be in both places at once because they had locked down. Um, you couldn't get on and off the ship for safety reasons, so I had to choose between being on a boat in the water or being up on top of the deck. And so the way I fixed that is, is that I got a camera, super clamped it to the rail, put the intervalometer there just to take a photograph every, you know, like 10 seconds and let it, let it roll. And then I went down onto the boat and shot this because I felt that this was going to be the icon, like this was going to be the hero shot that they needed. So I bring this, uh, I call up National Geographic. I emailed one of the photo editors that I met, and she referred me back to another photo editor who was somebody I had worked with at The New Yorker and had met with while she was still at The New Yorker. I was able to set up an appointment with National Geographic, um, went back down, and um, it was just, it was a really wonderful experience. It was about 20 photo editors in the room, and I went through basically all that stuff that you just saw. and. Uh, they, I think, really got my obsession a lot better because four years I had it, but not anywhere as much. And now with all these other projects and the other assignments and with, the, you know, with New York Times as being one of the clients, they um, had hit like a new level in my career from where I was four years before. And while I was showing the work, uh, one of the photo editors in the room asked if I knew about this ship, about the SS United States. And I was like, I've seen it, I've driven past it, I've never shot it. And he was like, I think one of our writers was on it when he was a kid. And so we went back and I met him and he was like, yeah, I traveled that ship when I was like eight years old with my parents. We went back and forth from Europe a number of times. And a friend of mine in New York, a former photo editor uh, from the New York Times, Stella Kramer, um, had introduced me to her brother a while back and she had mentioned it that he was like in relationships with the conservatory because there's this whole conservatory trying to keep the ship out of the scrapyard and as a, like a national uh, monument that holds a speed record and um, they just didn't want it to turn into scrap metal. And so um, David got an email chain immediately. We had a conference call right away with the executive director of the, of the ship with the writer and uh, she was great, Susan was wonderful. But the timing worked out really well because like they had a press conference, I think like January 15th, that one of the cruise lines had bought, had agreed to take the ship and put it back into service. They're gonna have to gut it, refurbish it and everything, but they've agreed that they're now actually going to start uh, using it as a uh, cruise ship again. Um, so two days later, National Geographic was able to launch my photo essay that I shot on this ship. And I spent three days um, 
shooting it. For getting back, you know, the community and your photography and everything, the thing that I stress a lot is just your, it's your emotional content is what is going to be separating you uh, and your work. So keep that in mind about what you've got access to and what your voice is and what you're attracted to because that's really what's going to be unique about it. You know, you need the skill set and everything, but once you have, you know, a camera and a lens and you're really already at a decent enough place and, you know, if you've got a phone, you've got a camera and there's people that are making careers just on that. So don't worry too much about, I don't have this, so therefore I can't do that. Um, find ways to make it work. Um, I am always still dealing with budgets, you know. I am still, you know, I've gotten the lift, now I'm trying to get the helicopter. So. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.